This is your water, isn't it? It is, yeah, thanks. I'm not going to commandeer it. <clears throat> Okay. Well, good evening, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the Paul Mellon Centre. I'm Martin Possel. I'm the senior research fellow here, or one of the senior research fellows here at the centre, and it's my pleasure again to introduce and host this evening's event. It's the fourth of six in this season's public lecture series. And I know that the, many of you are now old hand, so I'm gonna keep my comments relatively brief, um, but I'd like to repeat again, as I always do, that no prior art historical knowledge is necessary uh, to attend the course as a whole, or indeed any of the talks. Oh, he said through the fog of his spanks. Like, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> And everyone is welcome to participate actively. So if please feel confident, as I always say, ask any questions that are important to you and raise any issues from the talk that you'd like to share and promote discussion uh, and open up fresh perspectives. There's always something new to say. Uh, a word once. Which will open the floor to the audience. Uh, we've got a roving mic. Uh, in the room, and that's in the hands of my colleague Esme, who has just popped out for a moment. She's the, the lady in pink, and um, and that's uh, and Mark, my colleague Mark Hallett at the back. He also is going to be fielding the online questions because welcome to all of you who are not in the room, uh, and as well as those of you are here. So it was great to have you all with us. So Mark will be keeping a close eye on that. So he'll be asking those questions on your behalf. We've got Richard in charge of live stream and technical support. Esme, as I say. Uh, and Zef, 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 Steph on the Zoom chat box and in front of house. And once we've finished our deliberations around 7.30, you're invited to join the drinks in the ante room, or if you've got other plans, you can leave and we'll be finished by eight o'clock. Um, one thing I must do, and it is very important, is read this notice out to you. It's the pre-event safety notice. There are no fire drills scheduled for the duration of this event. If the fire alarm sounds, leave your belongings behind and calmly begin to evacuate the building. Your nearest fire exits are on the ground floor through either of the front doors. That's number 16 where you came in or number 15. We've got two front doors, but that's the one we usually use. And this is very important. Please assemble outside number 28 Bedford Square. Don't just go outside and stand on the pavement because if you go out, you need to be there so we can count you. So we know that you're out of the building. So please don't just wander off and think you've had enough. <laughs> so that is important. And uh, we'll advise you when it's safe to come in if it's uh, if it's safe to do so. Okay, so that's the fire instructions. So um, to the main event. My pleasure to introduce Dr. Nicholas Robbins. Nick received his BA and his PhD from Yale University. And since 2020, he's been a lecturer in British art at University College London. Currently, he's writing a book on the aesthetic, scientific, and cultural history of climate in the 19th century Britain. Uh, his recent article, Re-examining the Relationship of John Constable and Luke Howard's Meteorological Aesthetics, received the 2022 Emerging Scholars Award from the 19th Century Studies Association. So congratulations to you and Nick for that. Right now, Nick's ongoing research projects include questions of individu individuation and incarceration in the drawings of George Rumley, uh, exhibition cultures and the spatialized articulation of racial difference in the early 19th century, elemental mediums and the deposition of history in the work of artists and thinkers like Charles Babbage, Winslow Homer, and Elizabeth Bishop, and he's got a longer term project on art's means of articulating resistance to state and imperial violence. Among Nick's publication, I'll just let me highlight a few, uh, in the Art Bulletin 2021, John Constable, Luke Howard, and the Aesthetics of Climate, uh, and then he wrote an essay exhibiting in wartime in the Bill Brandt Henry Moore publication uh, and the accompanying exhibition, or that accompanied the exhibition, which was curated by Martina Droth and Paul Messier. And then he was also involved as a co curator of Sublime and Picturesque, or Picturesque and Sublime, Thomas Cole's Transatlantic Inheritance. You might remember that exhibition, which was also here at the National Gallery in 2018. Okay, so Nick's talk tonight centers on his research on into that most mercurial of artists, George Romney. He's a bit one of those Marmite figures. Uh, 
I'm not going to tell you which way I, what, what I think. Um, and his talk about his unsettling series of incarceration drawings. So Nick, might I invite you now to on, welcome you to the podium. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you, Martin, for that very nice introduction. And thank you for having me as part of this wonderful series. Um, and thank you to the other speakers who um, have already contributed great things to it. Um, before I jump in, I also just want to thank Nermeen Abdullah and Esme Bogus for um, making it all possible. And a special thanks to Maisoon Rehani for helping me get um, wonderful images of the drawings I'll show you tonight. And thank you all for coming. I'll just jump right in. The painter George Romney tended to shun the public nature of the artist's profession in late 18th century Britain. Something of his relationship to self-display can be insinuated from this large group portrait finished late in his life around 1796. It depicts in front and center the poet and patron of arts, William Haley, who stands confidently in a long blue cape, hand resting firmly on a cane. To his left is the sculptor John Flaxman, one of Haley's friends and protégés, shown carving Haley's likeness on a large bust at the edge of the canvas, his finger resting on the declivity in the chin of the bust. So, leaning in serpentine pose before Flaxman is Thomas Alfonso Haley, William Haley's uh, illegitimate son, who was training as a sculptor under Flaxman. This painting stages art making as a scene of reciprocity and intimacy, as well as something quite grave and rather serious. But Haley's grand stare is both doubled and strangely undermined by the figure at the left of the canvas. He smiles oddly, almost impishly or coyly behind his spectacles, turning to look at us over his shoulder and brandishing a palette with a few touches of paint. This, you might guess, is Romney himself. The painting was intended as a record of friendship and the illumined circle of Haley's patronage, but this light of visibility and clarity that produces that unity is qualified by the register of obscurity into which Romney seems to vanish. This group portrait dramatizes something fundamental about the career of George Romney. He was one of the most sought after portrait painters in Georgian London, producing a voluminous and varied set of likenesses of the wealthy, aristocratic and notable members of British society, as in the paintings you see here on screen. He famously vied with Joshua Reynolds for preeminence in the field of portraiture, at least for a time, and his reputation as a serious painter and a favorite of the market lasted well into the early 20th century before it sharply declined. But he also, at the same time, refused to participate in the official spaces of sociability and professional self-advancement, particularly the exhibitions of the Royal Academy, and all but stopped exhibiting his paintings by the end of his career. And yet throughout that career, Romney would pursue, alongside his business of producing such portraits, a very different enterprise that took place largely in private. The development of a radical and in many cases quite anomalous ideas for history paintings whose effective charge and aesthetic language sharply differed from the public image of the social world enacted in his portraits. The looseness and gestural freedom of his drawings has always puzzled viewers used to the exacting lucidity and restraint of his portrait paintings. My talk tonight will examine the largest group of these works, a set of drawings that Romney made in preparation for a painting that would celebrate the life of John Howard, who gained renown in the 1770s as an advocate for prison reform in Britain and in Europe more broadly. Howard cast light on what a later biographer would call the prison world of Europe the corrupt practices of jailers, the dangerous conditions of incarceration, and the abuses of power that undermined the potentially reforming capacity of those institutions. And in the early 1790s, Romney made, by some counts, over 500 drawings at a variety of scales and in different media in which he developed ideas for a painting that would show Howard visiting a crowding, foreboding, crowded foreboding prison room, one of which you see 
here. But Romney never completed the painting. It would be easy to make too much of this failure. What would it have meant for Romney to make a painting that showed, however obliquely, the stratum of misery which the stark changes in 18th century property relations had produced, the very changes that had occasioned the wealth of many of his sitters. The drawings of Howard and the prison world stage a space of shadows that, not unlike Romney's own leering presence in the shadow of the circle of his friends, deflates the certainties of self-possessed identity and prosperity put forward in his portraits. These kinds of questions motivate my talk, and yet they're also in some ways unanswerable. And so instead tonight, I wanna to think about why this subject fascinated Romney and what the strange hold was that this world had upon him, this imagined prison. And so I'll first introduce Romney's work and his earlier explorations in historical painting and give a brief overview of prisons and prison reform in this moment before turning to the complex interplay between Howard's work, Romney's drawings, and the adumbrated figures of the prison world as they play out across the series of these strange works. Historical painting, the multi-figure depiction of a narrative from <clears throat> literature, antiquity, or history was, as you'll have heard already in this course, the highest aim for artists in the 18th century academic system. Portraiture, which Romney called cursed drudgery, was the way in which artists were able to form, earn a living, but it was the constant and vexed struggle of 18th century British artists to develop a notion of history painting which would be adequate to the economic, social, and political conditions of British art and society. Romney's ambition from the very beginning of his career was to contribute to this effort. Indeed, one of the very first paintings Romney exhibited upon his arrival to London in 1762, after a few years as a provincial portrait painter, was a work called The Death of General Wolfe. Now, this painting subject, the dying major, major General James Wolfe, a hero in the 1759 battle for Quebec during the Seven Years' War, will be familiar to you already, as Esther Chadwick discussed in her lecture, it would be later taken up by the Anglo-American painter Benjamin West in, her in his 1770 entry to the Royal Academy exhibition. Like West's later work, Romney's painting broke with academic conventions, representing the protagonists of historical painting in contemporary garb. But unlike West's work, the painting did not bring Romney such fame and was snubbed indeed for a prize when it was first exhibited in 1763. Yet he did manage to slowly build up a successful portrait practice in London over the 1760s while continuing to pursue works that might demonstrate his other aspirations. One of my very favorite of these uh, which was the first painting by Romney I, I really looked at closely is his painting, The Artist's Brothers, Peter and James, exhibited in 1766. In this work, Romney stages, through the medium of his two brothers, his idea of artistic practice. His brother James stands, leaning on the chair, looking down onto a drawing easel at which his brother Peter sits, and which displays a piece of paper with geometrical figures. James, meanwhile, gestures downwards to a classical bust on the table beside them. Like Romney's Wolf, this painting suggests that Romney aimed to show both himself and the art of painting in the most ambitious light possible as a learned philosophical undertaking drawing on abstract and antique learning. And it was the need to accrue the latter that motivated Romney in 1772 to leave for travels in Italy, where he might gain access to the great works of antiquity and Renaissance painting. But perhaps more decisive for him on that trip was his exposure to the work and particularly the drawings of, the, of Henry Fuseli, the Swiss artist then resident in Rome. Fuseli's pared down, tonally dramatic and effectively charged drawings, which often took scenes of extremity, such as exorcism and visionary sight as their subject, exercised a considerable and long lasting effect on Romney. And while this influence was not quite evident in the newly accomplished portraits he would 
complete upon his return to England in 1775, he did continue to explore this new figurative language in drawing, this time at grand scale in these enormous drawings uh, now in Liverpool, which he completed in the 1770s. Um, these so-called cartoons um, stage multiple layers of visionary or dreamlike experience in which scenes of bodily struggle and vulnerability play out. And though they were intended to be worked up into history paintings, such ambitions were continually deferred. And so I think it's interesting to think about how even um, in this, this earlier moment, right, drawing is this really key um, space for Romney's thinking. Romney's conflicted ambition to his relationship to his ambition for, uh, for history painting might be seen as the real subject of the group portrait I started with. As Romney's patron, Haley, William Haley, was constantly urging the artist to realize his ideas for history paintings and to take on a leading role in the world of English art. Romney formed part of the circle of artists that Haley often gathered at his home, Eartham, which included the sculptor, the sculptor Flaxman, poets William Cooper and Charlotte Smith, and William Blake. The latter would eventually find Haley's interventions into his friend's professional life to be a bit too much, penning a poem on Haley's friendship in which he writes, quote, when Haley finds out that you cannot do, that is the very thing he'll set you to. This we might say was the dynamic between Haley and Romney as well, who was constantly being urged to produce pictures he was never able to complete. And his drawings on the subject of John Howard a particular obsession of Haley's were one such project. Prison though was not an unknown subject to Romney before he started these works for other reasons. Here we can return to the painting of the conversation between his two brothers. James Romney, his older brother served in the Bombay army and spent the majority of his life in British India. His brother Peter, meanwhile, attempted to follow his older brother George into the life of an artist, but he was plagued by mental instability and financial problems, and in 1774 he was, in his own words, quote, arrested and cast into prison by Mr. Allwood and Murray, his, his creditors. My arrest was so public that it was known by everybody directly, though my imprisonment has lost me the opinion of a few people not worth having, it has interested several in my behalf. Though he got out of jail by, other, by means of such others' generosity, he died soon after in 1777. This incident in Romney's own life illuminates a number of key issues beyond the painter's own experience dealing with the social and personal turmoil associated with incarceration. Debtors made up a large portion of imprisoned persons in 18th century Britain more than half of the population in jail, and Peter Romney would have been one of the two to 4,000 people arrested by their creditors each year. Alongside debtors were those arrested on criminal charges. But unlike today, prolonged incarceration was not a prevalent form of punishment in the 18th century. Instead, punishments like banishment or display in the pillory might be prescribed, while for more serious offenses, or at least offenses considered to be more serious, the usual punishments were execution or forcible transportation abroad to North America. Over the course of the 18th century, the latter punishments were handed down for a sharply increasing number of crimes, most of them having to do with theft or damage of property, many as a result of new property rights, which were seized by means of the enclosure of lands that were formerly held in common. And as Meredith Gamer has charted in her really important work, which will be familiar to those who attended the online lectures on Hogarth, I think last year or the year before, the spectacle of execution, which was always public, exerted a grave hold on the public imagination and indelibly shaped the forms of art making in the 18th century. So jails in this moment then were mostly places of temporary confinement before execution or transportation. Before the War of Independence in North America, the American colonies were the most usual destination for those transported, somewhere between 30 and 60,000 people over the course of the 18th century. But the loss of these colonies in 1776 led to a particular problem for uh, Britain's uh, prison <clears throat> population, 
which began to build up precipitously in what was widely seen as a crisis. The solution to which officials resorted was holding the imprisoned in Old Navy vessels or hulks docked in the Thames that were notorious for the dangerous and unhealthy conditions and signs that Britain's piecemeal system of jails and prisons was breaking down. There had been periodic efforts to examine and reform prison practices, such as the 1729 Committee in the House of Commons, which investigated practices at the debtor's prison, the Fleet in London, which Hogarth uh, made into a painting. And while this is framed as a benevolent, if anomal anomalous project of social concern, the most proximate cause for these periodic attempts to reform prisons was less one of charity. Rather, it was the specter of jail fever, or what we would now call typhus, and the threat that its spread could pose to society outside of the prison, which spurred on most public concern for reform. These outbreaks led to periodic but uncoordinated calls for reforming the unhealthy conditions of British jails. And I'll draw your attention briefly to a really interesting scheme for ventilating um, Newgate Prison, which uh, we can talk about more. Such concerns were the backdrop for the work of John Howard, the reformer to whose life and work Romney's drawings were dedicated. Howard was born in 1726 to a prosperous, non-conforming family, yet was not interested in most of the trappings of such a leisurely life. But when he was appointed in 1773 as the High Sheriff of Bedfordshire, he found, as it were, his calling. The position of High Sheriff was an office often passed around to different members of the gentry in 18th century Britain, and one that was often neglected. Howard, though, decided to take this position a bit more seriously, and it was in this capacity that he first visited a prison, the local prison in Bedford. Arriving there, he was shocked to see prisoners who had been acquitted of their crimes, but would not be let out because they owed fees to the jailers to secure their release, a widespread practice among jailers to, ge to generate revenue. And so this led Howard on a long quest to investigate these corrupt practices in jails across England, where he, quote, beheld scenes of calamity, which I grew daily more and more anxious to alleviate. The result of his investigations was published in 1776 as State of the Prisons in England and Wales and sparked a widespread, almost sensational consciousness about the need for reform, one that made Howard famous as an exemplar of the 18th century ideal of philanthropy. And before turning to the drawings, I think it's important to say that Howard was not in any way opposed to the idea of incarceration or the need for punishment. On the contrary, he was more incensed that what he did find in the jail was an inefficient and corrupt system, one that enriched those in charge of overseeing them, um, while the spaces in which th that they oversaw were uh, full of, you know, drinking and gambling and um, other immoral practices. These prisons were also choked with diseased air, which needed to be circulated and dispelled, walls whitewashed to stave off the threat of jail fever. And so in this sense, Howard wanted prisons to be better and that he wanted them to work toward the reform of the mind and the body and toward a different version of society. This then is the kind of reforming spirit that Romney might have aimed to represent. So let's turn then to the drawings. Here's a lot, here is one of the large ink, wash, and graphite drawings that Romney made, probably about 1790 or 92. On the left hand, a square of light centers on the figure of Howard, shown pointing at a jailer who holds a massive key. Echoing the shape and gesture of Howard's left arm, we see a dark diagonal shadow that overtakes the space, hovering over the bodies of prisoners massed near the ground. Some are slumped over in agony, while others hold out upstretched faces and arms toward Howard and the jailer. It is a scene of confrontation. Howard seems with one arm to hover over the abject bodies of the prisoners in an act of protection or almost benediction. With the other arm pointing to the jailer, he accuses him almost as if to push him out of the edge or out of the picture itself by the force of his disapproval. 
It is a scene then which has all the elements of history painting. We are placed within a scene of dramatic action in which a gesture sets the figures of the painting in motion. It frames Howard as a world historical protagonist, one whose force of conviction is imagined to be able to hold the whole painting together. Like Romney's earlier efforts in the 1760s, it was also a modern history painting, that is a painting which depicted the more recent past and which attempted to make out of the present something timeless, instructive and grand. And so it was perhaps this reason why William Haley had originally suggested that Romney make a portrait of Howard, a suggestion that Howard refused, and then instead a history painting. And so while it was not until later at this moment that Romney began to make this series of drawings, his first attempt at such a picture was in 1780 when he provided the frontispiece for a long um, and quite terrible poem that Haley wrote about the reformer. This image engraved by Francesco Bartolozzi is a much simpler, almost diagrammatic version of the scene we just saw in his later drawing. The figures have been reduced to three, the prisoner seeming to expire in chains on the left, the rough-faced jailer, his arms held behind him, and Howard at the center, his hand raised as if taken aback. Beyond a few interesting details, like the engraved lines that hover over the prisoner's body, seeming to dissolve along with the waning life of the prisoner, it is a rather straightforward image. The generalized setting recalls some of the other images of imprisonment which fellow artists would produce around this time, such as Joseph Wright of Darby's The Captive, seen here in a 1787 engraving, whose subject was derived from Lawrence Stern's Sentimental Journey. The distinction, of course, is that Romney's picture shifts our attention wholly, solely from the prisoner. In Wright's picture, we occupy the place of the viewer of sensibility, responding with pity to Stern's literary character. While in Romney's frontispiece, Howard comes into view instead as the central subject of the picture, it is his response to the sight of the prisoner which we are called upon to witness, not the prisoner's plight itself. This sense of Howard as a kind of roving prosthetic of the cult of philanthropic sensibility is thus both the subject and the problem of the picture Romney wanted to make. And that problem then was what exactly is the dramatic action? Is it Howard's gesture of confrontation? Was it the staging of his act of witness to the horrors of the prison world? I think it was this problem of action where it could be situated, one which haunted many history painters at this moment. Uh, I think it was this problem that dogged Romney over the four years that he spent making these hundreds of drawings for the scene. In this one, for example, the same elements remain yet shift in their emphasis. Strangely, the jailer's body grows larger and more menacing as he turns his back to us while Howard's body shrinks, except for the dark claw that hangs over a man holding up the expiring body of a woman. Meanwhile, different ink washes pick out more closely the corpse-like body which is lying on the table to the right and the imploring heads that seem to emerge out of thickened obscurity. The image is thus divided into a zone of action in Howard's figure and a zone of dissolution or collapse which nevertheless distracts from the image's supposed subject. In other drawings, such shifting of perspective and focus grows vertiginous. Here we seem to have had our viewpoint brought low to the ground, not sharing the lofty world of Howard's vantage on the scene, but instead taking on the view of the prison's victims. The dying man is low to the ground, a figure kneels over him as if to press their head against his heart, and a child stands leaning over the body while another female figure leans back covering her face in agony. Instead of appealing outward for justice, Howard seems almost to be backing away, although the damage to the drawing's sheet may be part of this effect. Sorry. Meanwhile, the act of, uh, oh, sorry, I see. Meanwhile, the shadowy atmosphere above the figures of the prisoners takes on a new, almost demonic life. Given the focus in Howard's work on the dangerous air of prisons, this seems plausible. 
Indeed, in another variation on the composition, this dark suggestion of atmosphere hardens into a kind of shadowy, reclining, deathful figure to which Howard seems to be pointing. Is the protagonist of the picture then even potentially this malign atmosphere? Looking at these shifting scenes, it becomes clear that an uncertainty about the focus and the locus of action itself was the problem Romney was attempting to work through. He was also doing so at a time when history painting was under another pressure of crisis, though not in Britain, but in revolutionary France, and indeed Romney was witness to this. In August of 1790, just as he had started working on some of his early drawings for the Howard painting, he, tra he traveled to Paris. Here we must note Romney's politics, which were unconventionally radical. Like his friends, he was very sympathetic to the cause of liberty in France and to the kinds of energies coursing through Europe in this moment. And on this trip, he came into contact with many key figures in this early stage of the French Revolution. Most influential of these was likely the artist Jacques-Louis David, uh, whose studio Romney visited and, uh, and with whom he, he met a few times. While other major paintings by David have a strong and traceable influence on Romney, it seems likely that in August 1790, he would have also have seen uh, David's ongoing studies for his painting, The Tennis Court Oath recording the decisive June 1789 meeting of the Third Estate. But the many drawings David made for this subject never resulted in a finished picture as the events of the revolution took on their own life. And as such, the provisional nature of drawing comes into stand for the uncertainties of painting's capacity to respond to moments of turmoil and upheaval. In a study of uh, British responses to the French Revolution, David Bindman has suggested that it is in his Howard, in Romney's drawings of Howard, that we can see most strongly the impact of the French Revolution on Romney, particularly the, the staging of sort of mercy and courage in Howard and the power of reason to liberate humanity from suffering. This kind of mercy and courage that Howard displayed was at the center of this cult of philanthropic feeling that I've been mentioning in which Howard became elevated as a hero. And it was Romney's job to find a language of gestures that could communicate this just as it was David's to find a language of gestures that could communicate revolutionary um, communality. Here, the expression and disposition of Howard's body itself then takes on a very um, particular importance as a means of modeling this kind of witnessing. And interestingly, Howard himself was very interested in the way he needed to carry himself, not only to project a sense of his purpose, but also indeed to protect his body from the contagion of the prison. In one of his notebooks that he carried around on his visits to prisons, he wrote seemingly only to himself that, quote, to maintain the rights of others requires strength and vigor of constitution, wisdom in the conduct of affairs, and the firmness which can baffle difficulties and dangers. Thus, temperance, prudence, and fortitude are necessary to, to practice justice. Um, these em this emphasis on emotions and passions, though, also had a basis in theories of medicine that held that powerful negative emotions like grief and fear um, and I'm drawing on the work here of Kevin Siena, who wrote a great book on this subject, that these powerful negative emotions could actually make one's body more susceptible to disease. And so the way that Howard um, sort of prepared himself, right, to enter into the prison was also to take on a certain kind of emotional um, or even affective stance. And we could, we could think about how the gesture of, of his bodies could be seen not only as something outwardly expressive, right, but also is as something of an inward layer of protection in which emotion is not about connection, but in, in fact, separation. In this regard, we can turn to one of the key sources in Romney's development as an artist, the work of the French academician Charles Lebrun on the passions, in which he mapped out the expressions of different passions, that is emotions and affects, upon the body and its gestures. 
It was one of the earliest books Romney had access to in the 1750s as he trained as an artist. And he seemed in the 1790s to return strongly to this model um, in his Howard drawings. Take this work in which a sort of Davidian uh, architecture of arches has been added to the scene. Uh, the overlapping close foreshortening of the bodies and their outstretched arms on the left strongly resemble David's oath of the Horatii. While the substance of their bodies is only faintly gestured at in the, in the sort of wash that um, Romney uses to build up the tones in the image, he also overlaid these forms with ink, especially in the faces, to show the almost bulging intensity of their facial gestures of appeal. The prisoners and the jailer congregating around the figure of Howard also show this range of fear and grief, supplication and horror. Howard's face though is a bit different. It shows clearly this meeting of furrowed brows, strong wrinkles forming on the forehead as if to show measured concern, but not quite passionate intensity. There's slightly more ambiguity though in the rest of his body. Romney has returned to the sheet to add these sort of intense scribbles in graphite around Howard's arms and hands, which are raised in this ambivalent gesture of response. And while the graphite adds a kind of gravity to Howard's hands and the shadow that it casts on the jailer behind him, this scribbling seems at once to kind of redouble the force of the gesture and also to cancel it out altogether. As Howard's own list of, of his sort of passions, right, temperance, prudence, and fortitude suggests there was something of a conflict regarding these questions of emotion and sympathy at this moment, one which ran along the lines of class. The passions presented a problem for 18th century conceptions of, the sense, of senses and the, of sensibility, and it was passions that paintings were most often intended to regulate rather than elicit or promote. It was also such passions like lust, envy, or intoxication that were imagined to lead people into, criminal, into criminality and dissolution, and indeed to lead to incarceration. On the other hand, the kind of regulated passions that, that Howard lists as his, right, laid the road to the philanthropic capacities that he modeled for a whole generation of British reformers. The dispassionate nature of Howard's writing, which when counterposed with the strong, almost um, sort of crazed response it elicited in the British public is often noted. The only passage in his book, The State of the Prisons, which seems to dwell in any stronger emotion is its very opening passage on distress. He writes, there are prisons into which whoever looks will at the first sight of the people confined there be convinced that there is some great error in the management of them. The sallow, meager countenances declare without words that they are very miserable. Many who went in healthy are in a few months changed to emaciated, dejected objects. Some are seen pining under diseases, expiring on the floors in loathsome cells of pestilential fevers and the confluent smallpox. Victims, I must not say to the cruelty, but I will say to the inattention of sheriffs and gentlemen in the commission of the peace. This is a very kind of conflicted passage, I think. On the one hand, in a way which might have appealed to a painter like Romney, we are enjoying to see how the very faces of the prisoners, right, their sallow, meager countenance, express without any need for language that how they have become these dejected objects. But Howard also backs away from the language of accusation. These prisoners are not the victims of cruelty, but of inattention. And the form of attention which Howard then paid in return was a relatively new one. The language of objective enumeration, numbers, statistics, facts, figures. His description of every jail and prison in England does not repeat this scene of dejection, but instead gives data about the demographics of its population, the size of its cells, the visibility of regulations. In this sense, it is a language of distance rather than proximity. Howard did not wish to draw his readers close to the scene, but rather to situate them in this distance position of knowledge. It's fitting in this sense that one of Howard's protocols to protect himself 
from jail fever following his prison visits was the fumigation of his clothes as well as the notebooks in which he recorded all of his information. After his immersion in the offensive air of a prison, he notes, the leaves of my mem memorandum book were often so tainted that I could not use it until after spreading it an hour or two before the fire. Howard imagined, rightly or not, that the contagion of the jail remained in the very paper he used to record his observations, like a scent lingering in his clothes, and in response aimed to purify them of this condition. In this sense, it's more of an anesthetic, a kind of dampening response, or even a kind of prophylactic against proximity than a conception of, a, of sensory immediacy or proximity. What kind of response might Romney have imagined these drawings would garner, especially if they had been made into a painting as he intended? In an essay on, quote, those kinds of distress which excite agreeable sensation, Anna Barbeau claimed that, we have indeed a strong sympathy with all kinds of misery, but it is a feeling of pure unmixed pain, similar in kind, though not equal into degree, in degree to what we feel for ourselves on the like occasions. And this never produces that melting sorrow, that thrill of tenderness to which we give the name of pity. They are two distinct sensations marked by very different external expression. One causes the nerves to tingle, the flesh to, to shudder, and the whole countenance to be thrown into strong contractions. The other relaxes the frame, opens the features, and produces tears. Any display of misery had to be framed, Barbeau, or so Barbeau thought, by this display of moral excellence, which in the case of Romney's drawings would have been Howard's resolve, right? This display of restrained response, this distance. And it's also worth noting that Barbeau's brother, John Aiken, was Howard's close friend and executor. In 1790, Romney would have begun to make these images at the very moment that visual culture would be mobilized at large scales to affect moral change. We can think here most prominently of the cause to abolish the transatlantic slave trade and images like the 1787 broadside of a slave ship published by the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade. Indeed, figures like William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson were explicitly seen as Howard's heirs in a tradition of philanthropic action. In this moment, images of both cruelty and supplication were mobilized to manufacture sentiment among the British public, but also to contain the threat of social destabilization that abolition would have meant to a society whose wealth was founded on enslaved labor. The question of the treatment of prisoners in Britain is of course not comparable in terms of cruelty and dispossession, but his work then I wanna suggest Romney's drawings about Howard exist in a kind of continuum with these larger projects of, of the reformation and refinement of British morality. And yet one wonders whether had Romney ever completed a painting anything like his drawings, whether it would have had this force of a reforming picture. Here we can compare it with a, a painting and a print that was indeed finished and published, Francis Wheatley's 1787 uh, uh, engraving um, and etching, visiting and relieving the miseries of a prison, depicting Howard shown gesturing to a family group gathered in a dungeon, an old man lying on a bed of straw. The stock rolls of the incarcerated figures in the prison are not far from the worthy poor who would then later be pictured, who would also be pictured at, at the same time in paintings by Thomas Gainsborough or George Moreland, presenting them as proper objects of concern. This didn't seem to be Romney's aim, at least in the way that his drawings now speak to us. If Howard tried to purge the air of the prison from his notebooks, which he saw as the source, source of death and disease, it seems Romney's drawings almost do the opposite. Look at this one, for example. Though it's unfinished, of course, the entire substance of the image seems to be uh, a kind of loaded atmosphere, as if the image were seeped in it. 
the broad arch of the prison space is articulated by modeling varied shades of depth into which figures in the background merge. The bodies of the prisoners are masked below, but the faint nervous outline of their body does not suggest that these figures possess a kind of autonomous um, corporeality, but instead to seem to be permeated by the air, particularly as it gathers in thick darkness around their bodies. Meanwhile, the gesticulating figure of Howard in, uh, shown in an underdrawing in layered ink washes is barely distinguishable from the space around him. More than the problem of gesture then and its legibility, what seems to be at stake here is the very separateness of each of these bodies, both from neighboring bodies, but also from the environment around it, right? Articulating them as these sort of separate protagonists in a painting. And this problem of, of picturing uh, the, the bodies of the incarcerated interestingly relates to Howard's own thinking about the dangerous and damaging conditions of the prison. During the 18th century, prisoners were almost exclusively housed in communal rooms. Um, but a number of writers and reformers began to urge a cellular model of incarceration. That is the placing of, of prisoners into separate rooms, whether permanently or for sleeping or you know, at night. In Howard's case, his advocacy for the separation of prisoners was both for purposes of sort of physical health, but also uh, purposes of moral health, right? Um, to sort of individuate and, and to separate out the prisoners from one another. Romney, on the other hand, seems to have been too interested in this tangle of bodies that could not be separated from one another and the charged fetid air in which they were set. The figures in his drawings follow a kind of stock characterization, even as they morph and mutate from drawing to drawing. A mother and child, a woman swooning, a female figure who leans over the edge of the image, figures of the insane or the, or the disturbed. The, figure, the female figure slumped in the arms of a companion seemed to be an image that was particularly redolent for Romney. Here we see this figure across four different drawings. Rather than gain any form of definition or integrity across them, uh, this, this female figure seems to lose it entirely. And so it's odd, it's odd too that this figure, which is actually the most consistent across all of these drawings, is also a body divested of its structure and capacities, indeed divested of its capacity to be separated from the body that, that holds it. In this image in which the prisoners have become the exclusive focus of Romney's imagination, um, it's very difficult to even solve um, the kind of outline of, of this female figure into a body of any kind legs and arms seeming to drape boneless from the hands of a man who's, uh, uh, whose neck seems to be sort of um, <laughs> bleeding almost a kind of ink or effort um, that, that, that reflects this kind of um, intermeshing of the two bodies. From the spare linear quality of the ink wash drawings, I've been examining his other drawings, particularly in his sketchbooks, became increasingly agitated and formless. In, this draw in, in these two drawings, Romney has worked and reworked many layers of graphite, smudging and erasing to produce figures that can only be properly described as voids against which the dark and vigorous mark making um, sort of gathers uh, to delineate the surrounding air. It is almost impossible to distinguish each of the bodies from one another. Rather, the round spheres of heads, necks, shoulders, and arms become a kind of hybridized or composite body enmeshed in a writhing mass. It was in these kinds of drawings that Romney's efforts to complete a composition for the Howard painting terminated around sometime around 1794 after he had filled in sheet after sheet of ideas. In these later drawings, the spare geometrical relations of that early 1780 frontiers piece that I, show you, I showed you before now dissolve into this kind of undifferentiated um, space of, of air and of, and of bodies. <laughs> 
such bodies, it would be my suggestion, present a kind of shadow to the many groups of perfectly individuated figures it was Romney's business to depict. Take this wonderful uh, painting, for example, a group portrait of the children of Granville and Louisa Leverson, Leverson Gower, uh, perhaps one of Romney's most accomplished portraits in which the children form a perfect chain. Interlaced and connected, but also independent in and of themselves, they move to the sound of a tambourine held aloft like graceful machines. For Romney to work out the Howard picture, he would have also had perhaps to resolve this great contradiction or relationship between these two kinds of paintings or images, I should say. That is how the property rights and claims of the wealthy had reshaped the criminal law of England, forcing people into states of incarceration and criminalizing means of self-sustenance at the margins of society. The individuality of the prisoner, their claim to be portrayed might have undermined the grounds of that individuality and self-possession that Romney's other portraits aimed at. But perhaps more to the point is the pleasure which Romney took in drawing these bodies that were linked and not separate, not the bounded individuals of his portraits, but instead something that formed a kind of indivisible conglomerate, however abject and terrible it might be. And so perhaps too, Romney's drawings show a kind of ambivalence about this kind of separation, right? <clears throat> that Howard wanted to affect in his reform of, of, of prisons, one that would you know, individuate each prisoner. They would be, um, treated as a kind of a single unit would produce them right as these proper subjects of the prison that could undergo internal reformation but that individuation would in turn break down this kind of delirious chain of bodies even though his politics shifted dramatically over the course of the 1790s Romney remained for a time energized by the French Revolution in October 1792 he wrote that Quote, the present moment is an epoch to liberty such as has never happened before since the creation. I confess the sublimity of it has interested it, has interested me, interested and agitated me so much. If such sentiments would be assiduously excised from his later biographies, it was perhaps because it suggested his belief in the capacities of a collective or a collectivity to reform the world in a very different way than figures such as Howard would intend to. And here it's worth noting that the new Newgate prison, the object of earlier for, uh, efforts to reform prison was finally completed around 1780 um, and then promptly burned to the ground during the Gordon riots of the same year. A different solution to the problem of this individuated body would be found in the system of incarceration and punishment itself. In part due to Howard's efforts, this moment saw the advent of many new ideas for criminal punishment with the passing of a law in 1779 to form a national penitentiary. And so penitentiary meaning a jail that uh, in which, uh, which is the punishment, right? Which is a place of, of reform. Um, rather than a, just a kind of way station. This, the 1790s also saw the elaboration of Jeremy Bentham's ideas for the panopticon. In the latter image of imprisonment, each prisoner is visible to the warden who occupies the center of a circular prison, but not to one another, a collectivity that is, which is invisible to those who form it. In the other model, the penitentiary, the reforming prison is reconceived as a zone of a sort of moral improvement itself and the prisoner becoming a subject that can be molded, improved, corrected, and made to work. This was achieved through many means, but most spectacularly in the 19th century through the quote unquote separate system in which prisoners' movements were restricted so as to prevent them from ever seeing or communicating with one another. This separation, which makes the prisoner into an individual unit is thus also an effacement of identity. And yet, as Caroline R. Scott has shown in a very brilliant article, I recommend everyone read, looking particularly to images published by the 19th century reformer Henry Mayhew, these images of dehumanized prisoners themselves seem to offer some kind of aesthetic, even erotic thrill, one that seemed to undermine the idea of reform that Mayhew was after. 
Something of this thrill haunts Romney's drawings too, though perhaps in a different fashion. Like his own self image in the group portrait with his friends, Romney seemed to think that perhaps some measure of one's own identity was better retained by receding into the shadows than by emerging into pure visibility. And so against the ordered world of elite Georgian society, a world in which Romney would never properly fit, the extremity of the suffering his drawings captured seems to exist for its own sake, a kind of shadow world of the healthy blooming faces that he painted each day. Thank you. So much, Nick, so much to think about. Um, that was fantastic. Do you want to come? We're going to occupy these yes. stools here. Perfect. I think this is, this is the format we've, you, you're probably aware of. My mic um, has come unhitched. I think I can I think it. Th am I now switched on, Richard, as it were? Um, so we're both switched on now. Fantastic. So we can, um, it's fairly, you know, very freewheeling in a sense, because it's not just about asking questions, it's about reflecting. You've given me certainly lots and lots of things to think about. So I'm just going to kick off with a few thoughts that, that came to me when you were talking. Um, I guess I, I'm, Romney is such a difficult figure yeah. because his biography obtrudes in so many ways. He himself was a troubled soul mm -hmm. throughout his life. Yeah. Uh, he deliberately pulled away from the center, as you said, whether it was exhibiting, socializing, he didn't go to dinner with Romney, he didn't come to you. Uh, he didn't really have many friends who were artists, one or two, but apart from that, and even with his patrons like Haley, you didn't think there was a great deal of love lost. Um, you, may, you were not even sure when Haley says, oh, I've got this fantastic idea. <laughs> Why don't you do this? It's like, you know, et cetera. And I'm just thinking about the, these in the, in the um, in terms of his biography about what was going on in his life in the, that period in going into the 1790s because although he had been always been troubled he he was in a very difficult place in, in many yeah. different ways living in Hampstead um he had this extraordinary kind of strange menage a trois which we still don't know enough probably we shouldn't know more about yeah. it um um, living in rather gloomy circumstances. His big cast collection had an extraordinary collection of classical casts. Was, you, you, I mean, you could sort of almost, you know, I'm probably exaggerating, but, you know, my, my mental picture of Romney's world and the, the erotic, gothic. yeah, and, the, and I think this, this erotic, which I thought you brought out brilliantly, this, this, the, 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 the bodies, the sort of squirming bodies, and, and this kind of miasma, and, and in this, Howard is this kind of strangely spiritual. He's almost like Dante visiting hell. He's a shadowy figure. He's a sort of strangely priest-like figure. And there's no specific specificity of place. Or, you know, you can't link these. And so how much of this is a reflection or kind of, you know, um, variations on a theme of something that was really... Because these are troubling drawings in many ways. So, you know, I'm just sort of teasing out of that kind of... Yeah, no, it's biographical great, aspect. It's a great question, Martin. I think, you know, it's not, I don't think it's a, a coincidence, right, that there, I mean, it's so hard to date Romney's drawings, but it seems around the same time he was also, you know, making drawings of hell. He was making drawings of the seven ages of, of man, right? So these images of sort of, of, of co sort of coming into life and passing away and passing out of life. Um, and absolutely his kind of lifelong, uh, depression had only gotten worse and worse in the 1790s. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah, it was it was a very unhappy time and a very strange time. And so I think in some ways that too is part of the kind of intensity that he brings to these drawings because clearly it takes, you know, this project takes on a life that far exceeds any painting that he would have ever made, right? It, ser mm -hmm. it, must, it served some kind of purpose for him to sort of continue over and over to make these drawings and but I think you know you're right to, that there's much more to be thought about this question of yeah what are the drives that this this serves and the cast collection too um, yes because you sorry can we get a, a, a mic to you just so don't you feel that you're slightly over the depression and whatever I mean we know that at times in his life 
he, the sort of black dog came on him and it affected him quite badly. But by the 1790s, he had emerged as the preeminent portrait painter of his day, if only because other people had died. Reynolds and Gainsborough had left the scene. And he was in his own way, the, the most successful artist in that area. And that rather goes against this idea that he was in some way descending into the blackness of, of despair. Also, uh, you touched on Lebrun uh, and his expressions, and, which was always a recurring theme with Romney. Um, if you go right back to the unveiling of Shakespeare, the infant Shakespeare, the, the same images of, of uh, despair and fury and, and you know, they're, they're there, and that's many, many years earlier. So they weren't sort of emerging same things in the 1790s. Yeah. They were a recurring theme. Yeah. He was developing in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. No, the, the question of, of, of the passions and of the kind of, um, yeah, the exploration of these of the kind of plasticity of the face, right? And what the face can do. That's something that he's doing mostly in his drawings, but also in his, in his paintings throughout his life, for sure. Okay, uh, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, we'll have a little, I opened it up, Mark, at the back. Um, yeah. I've got, a, I've got a question actually from the great uh, from the expert, Alex Kidson. So, ah, uh, no. <laughs> he's obviously been watching and enjoying your talk, uh, Nick. So he asks, what does uh, Nick think of the idea that Romney did not seriously contemplate a painting of Howard? 500 drawings and not even a single oil sketch, let alone anything more finished. It appeared when he did complete subject painters in oils of Milton and Newton yeah. and Midsummer Night's Dream. So a sense that these are drawings which may not have ever really been imagined as ones resulting in a painting, is Alex's suggestion, or what do you make of that? Mm. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I'm intimidated to be speaking to the expert. Um, I think it's, I think it's probably correct. I mean, it seems that if he ever probably intended to make a painting, he gave up on that pretty fast. Um, and yet I'm not sure I just, I wonder then why he would continually repeat that motif. You know, there, it was still a subject, right? It was still an image that had a hold on him. So whether or not that image was meant to become a painting um, is a good question. And, and it makes me think back to those, you know, large drawings from the 1770s, right? These cartoons that I showed you that are enormous. Um, they ostensibly too were meant to be made into paintings, but in a way, they're finished almost as if they were they were works intended almost to be exhibited. And, um, you know, I guess my answer to that question is, I don't know what I think of that, but I think it could could absolutely be the case that he sort of, he sort of realized there was this impossible project or one that he could only work through in this private mm. space. Because nobody was asking, there wasn't the patrons who were saying, I want this picture exactly. and that's the difference whether it's Boydell or somebody else exactly. if somebody's putting money on the table and they're commissioning you and they're yeah. saying okay um so when Boydell does come put money right. on the table everybody has a go because whether they're useless or good <laughs> they, they want to do it so I yeah. think this was something that was going on as a kind of light motif in his life at the time so I think to, to ask whether it was going to be finished did he finish it is, is maybe not what it's yeah the driver there yeah um I don't, I don't know. It's sort of like why not? Why didn't he finish it? But why did he keep working on it? Yeah. It could be that he, uh, you know that he was fixated on on people like uh, Lady Hamilton, and yeah. he would just keep on repeating and repeating, and perhaps that could be an explanation of it. Because yeah. he was a great non-finisher as well, I mean, or at least he took his time, as we know, with with portrait. He's very fast, quick off the blocks, but he yeah. didn't always. You know, get the commission get, done. Get the get it done, Mark. I've got another quite long question or a set of observations from David Sulkin. Um, he asks, well, he's he. This is his comment. I'll just read it out. I'm surprised that you had so little to say about Romney's depiction of the bodies of prisoners and of male prisoners in particular. Surely, one of the most striking features of these images, especially the studies in pen and wash, is the heroic, idealized character that Romney has given to the naked bodies of his imprisoned men. 
it seems to me that this creates at least two pro obvious problems, one for Howard and one for the prisoners themselves. Surely the problem for Howard in the context of the conventions of history painting is that the juxtaposition of his figure with these powerful male nudes makes him look decidedly non-heroic, and in this sense, less significant than his suppressed, oppressed social inferiors. For the prisoners themselves, the problem is that heroic bodies are not meant to inspire his sympathy, but admiration or even emulation. It's as though the way Romney has approached the problem of representing Howard contains the seeds of its own impossibility. Can I ask for your thoughts on this? I think it's a marvelous um, suggestion, and it's a very important one too, because I think, um, yes, there's the kind of erotics of, of the kind of distended body, but then there's also this kind these, I mean, maybe we can go back to one of them just so that we have one on the screen. But I think this question of that kind of um, intensely rendered male body um, and even this sort of repeat, I guess I focus on the slumping woman, but also the kind of the, the male figure holding that woman up um, has something to do with this problem of, of power. And so I do think um, that that really interesting observation has much to do with this, the problem of where Howard sits in the picture, right? Because what is what gesture is, um, is sort of commensurate. Um, he, he himself, um, by refusing to submit himself to be painted as a portrait, he, he also refused to take on any kind of, um, any kind of public um, or sort of heroic stand. Um, so yes, I think in a way, you could say that that is one of the seeds of the, the kind of impossibility of the picture is that the kind of language of hero, heroism, at least as it's invested in male bodies was um, sort of completely scrambled, at least in, in Romney's imagination. But thank, I, I thank him for that um, very, very perceptive comment. Uh, there's, a, there's a microphone whizzing down to you. Do we know how much time Romney actually spent in a prison? Because I suppose another aspect of Tolkien's sort of comment on that is that is this actually is the problem also that there's a social reality that he's gesturing towards, but actually what he's engaging with is a purely artistic sort of question, artistic ideal. And that, again, it's the same sort of dichotomy that you've got there. It's a great question. Um, and I think that also points to this interesting sort of cleavage between, let's say, Howard's project and Romney's project, because again, Howard's, Howard's um, work and the kind of force it exerted was all about the, his presence there. And indeed his kind of heroism was related to his martyrdom in the sense that he died 1790 after contracting um, a disease in now modern day Ukraine, as we were talking about before. And so, you know, Howard, the, the reason Howard had authority was the fact that he not only had been there once, but he had been to every single prison and, and, and could attest to that. Um, whereas, yes, Romney's is a complete work um, of the imagination. And so maybe it's also this space of sort of projections about these problems of sort of class um, and, um, and authority and the figure. Mm. So that's a really interesting mm. suggestion. Thank you. David's point about, of course, when I was scribbling my notes, I mean, I was thinking it's, it's about the fact that they're already lost souls is very different from the Howard. You know, he's about how do you improve? How do you get the system to work? It's a progressive kind of idea. Whereas in these, they're all they're already, and this is this is very Michelangelesque. It is heroic. That's where you see male male figures writhing together because they're already in hell. <laughs> <laughs> they're not getting out. It's a hell yeah. in in that sense. But I mean, you, you, your your suggested reading was was about uh, Rodney's drawing on the Grand Tour and yeah. his and the strong vein of classicism yeah. in it, which was driving it. His collection of classical casts and music was not an accident. Yeah, this is, these were not drawing aids. Yeah. And the fact that he was surrounded them, he didn't run an academy. This is very different. He wasn't inviting people around to, you know, or, or giving sort of tuition. Yeah. It was very much part of his, his mental so world. And I'm not world. saying that pejoratively, but it, it, it was very much an important fact. Um, Mark. Yeah, I've got a question, Nick. I wonder if you can just turn to some of the pencil drawings, which yeah. are the 
the ones which are the, the yeah I, I mean when I see these um in a, in a, in a kind of technical way there they are the kind of drawings that um artists produce when they're thinking about chiaroscuro yeah and that is the the play of light and shade and darkness and light across an image it's a way of exploring the language of light and shade across an image and they're really and whenever whenever you see 18th century artists doing this it's always fascinating because for them light and shade is a language and it can articulate and, and enforce or reinforce narratives um, uh, within the within the image very very powerfully so on the one hand there's a depiction of the individual bodies and the figure or relationships which you are interested in looking at these in but how would you read their language of light and shade and their changing language of shade over the sequence of drawings that you looked at of this kind because they are exercises or explorations and essays in different forms of chiaroscuro mm. yeah it's a really interesting question um I mean, I think you right, and it, and the sequence is a bit imagined, right? Because it's hard to know which ones were made earlier. But I think in in the kind of ink washed ones, right, where he's giving us this very sort of defined architecture, right, where the kind of shadow is is really about um, sort of bringing um, something into uh, relief, right? And here, I think the kind of sculpture gallery that he would view in darkness is is important, and so. In a way, what I see almost is the kind of um, is almost an advancing forward in the picture, but also forward in prominence of a sort of shade in which it kind of overtakes the figures as the kind of primary subject. And so I think, um, you know, when you look at them in person, some of them, um, this one in particular, it's kind of. Um, it's it's kind of not shocking, but it's quite striking how many layers of graphite there are here. I mean, he's really, really going um, into the paper. And so not only is that a kind of measure of the sort of um, the sort of gestural force, but I think it's almost the sense in which that the sort of the shade of chiaroscuro, let's say, or the kind of negative positive relationship kind of becomes reversed in this um, potentially destabilizing way. I think you see that particularly in the kind of left-hand part um, of the image. And so I think, you know, in a way, right, what's interesting is that the most kind of forceful or gestural language of, of, of this drawing, right, is not invested in the figure and in, and in forming its outline, but rather in invest, is invested in, in this kind of um, uh, atmosphere, right, that he's trying to produce and to kind of invest with a kind of force. Thank you, that was great. Um, yeah, so just regarding his revolutionary enthusiasms through this, through this period, so he goes to Paris in um, August 1790, and, uh, you know, it's one month after the Festival of Federation, the first anniversary of the storming of the Bastille, uh, all the rhetoric is about light in the darkness. It's about liberation and reform. But mm -hmm. in October 1792, he's talking about the sublimity of revolution in, in still approving terms, which is one month after the September massacres, where the prisoners of Paris are slaughtered en masse in Paris's, Paris's prisons. Yeah. You know, the dominant imagery is that of a pile up of corpses. So, you know, mm -hmm. is there some way in which, you know, some inability to reconcile those two things is part of the impossibility of the images as well. Well, you know, he still maintains this revolutionary enthusiasm. Thank you, Richard. That's really interesting um, and helpful. And I do think, you know, in in the in the kind of trying to track Romney's sort of political sympathies, that um, comment has always stood out as a kind of odd one because it it kind of comes after most of the other enthusiasts of the revolution in Britain had said, okay, never mind. <laughs> um, um, and so what was he, um, you know, what was he responding to? And so I think that idea of this kind of contradiction on the one hand of, of um, his own kind of fasc fascination with um, sort of a completely imaginary form of death, right? Of, of kind of uh, 
uh, the body in pain versus this actual um, very extreme version. Um, yeah, I think that could be part of the problem, but I think it's also, I guess what I was trying to also suggest at the end was that, um, not that that massacre was, uh, you know, um, a demonstration of the power of uh, the people, but I think there was still in him this sort of um, belief in that kind of entangled subjectivity, right? Um, that had something to do with the French Revolution and maybe something to do with his fascination in the subject, even if it becomes completely contradictory um, at a historical level. But I'll have to ask you more. Yeah. Do we know what Remy thought about David's sort of political positions? Because that is very different. He is not just drawing it, he's there, he's part of it. He is himself a politician. A participant. Yeah. No, I mean, he says almost nothing about his trip and his letters. He was not a, a great, uh, at least that I know, maybe others know, know better, but. Um, as far as, as far as I know, um, he doesn't actually write much down about his response to his trip to Paris. But just picking up on that, he, he, one of his friends from France was Madame de Chimelet. Yeah. He visited her right at the beginning of the revolution, and she eventually fled yeah. from the revolution and stayed in London, and Romney knew her quite well. So he was obviously, by the early 1790s, getting some quite detailed first-hand knowledge of what had happened in France. Remembering we didn't have 24-hour news in those days, and so people must have been very dependent on the one or two sources that they were able to uh, rely on. Knowing that Romney had this sort of slightly depressive, manic depressive tendencies, I, I it seems to me anyway not unreasonable to assume that the way in which the revolution developed and the way in which it went off the rails, as it were, in terms of the great hopes that people had for it at the beginning towards the absolute despair that it created for many people towards the end, the effect on Romney, I would have thought, would have been very, very depressing. And if this project had some way become locked in with what was happening in France and with his responses to it, I, I don't find it that surprising that it ran out of steam. Mm. He was also getting very busy. He had a lot right. of this accursed portrait painting. Um, and so it, it looks as though it just lost emphasis for him. But it was set against this problem of the political background and the disillusionment that he obviously ultimately felt with the French Revolution. Yeah, I think that's a good way of framing it, absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I'm very hesitant because I'm not an art expert, but I was wondering if um, Romney's prison scenes could also have responded to things like Burke's speech in the Commons in, I think, 1792, where he called out James, the young James Watt, James Watt Jr. and Thomas Cooper for their address to the Jacobin Club, and the subsequent treason trials and threats of treason trials, which usually ended in acquittals in England, because it was, for anybody of a radical frame of mind, a very frightening time when it did seem as though certain British radicals who had expressed revolutionary sympathies were in danger of being executed. And certainly when you think of things like the um, King and Church riots, the pro-King and Church riots of 1791 across Britain, um, the position of people supporting the revolution was not very secure. And I wonder if some of that might have been expressed in the prison scenes. Well, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. I mean, I think it, yeah, it's quite interesting how, despite his kind of, I mean, he was said, it was said that his house was one of the few that Thomas Paine was safe in London. You know, Romney had this kind of close association um, with people who were in, um, who were exposed to this this real crackdown, um, and so absolutely, I think he he would have known what dangers were involved in that. 
On the other hand, you know, it's interesting that, you know, as much as maybe this, this sort of project might have been tied in with some kind of revolutionary or at least, um, you know, uh, different political sensibilities, you know, Howard was absolutely a, an establishment figure. He was the person who was meant to run the new state-run penitentiary. So he was, you know, to represent Howard and to represent him as a kind of um, uh, uh, salvific force, that would have been seen as, as absolutely sort of enmeshed with some idea of the aspirations of, of the British state. And so I think the problem then is what that kind of representation had to do with his other kind of fascination with this um, tangle. But it's it's a really good question, one I should I'll, I'll need to think about more. No, yes, at the back we'll come to. to I've, I've got a, a question um, from Janet Collot, who's asking. I wondered if, like the links you made with Atlantic enslavement, in particular Wedgwood's kneeling, shackled black man. Romney may have gained inspiration from images of incarcerated madness. That is he drawing on a, a kind of an imagery of incarcerated madness that existed in, in the period? Janet Collot's asking. It's a great, it's a very good question. And, and this uh, one of the other kind of, I'm not sure it's in any of the drawings that I put in my PowerPoint, but one of the other kind of stock figures is this kind of figure of the insane um, or of, of someone in a kind of state of, of mental. Um, extremity. And so, um, yes, I, I think absolutely there's, there's also a kind of um, uh, a visual culture or, or visual language of madness that he's, that he's drawing on and that, you know, similar to, um, similar to so a later painter like Jerry Coe would also be very interested in sort of isolating um, these kind of gestures of, um, being out of one's mind or being insensible. Yeah, good question. Um, my background is completely non-artistic and right. I have never heard of John Rumney until my colleague oh, okay. brought me along. But I did in my work, work for very rich people. And it, the fact that he has owned, owned 400 cartoons, I just wonder, Sometimes when you put the phone down them, some people kick, you know, the waste paper basket. Some people put on tape that they really like to stand and they wipe it off. And I used to find going to the pub and having a stiff drink. And I just wonder whether Romney did these just to calm himself down. This is what life is really about. Not all these rich people that I, I earn my living by. And this is his way of, um, as it were, calming down. <laughs> I think that's very interesting. <laughs> the sort of therapeutic, the therapeutic value of sketching a tangle of sort of abject bodies, and one that maybe should be, you know, recommended. Yeah. But it's a serious point, isn't it? No, it, I don't. Yeah, no, no, I know. Really I, not point. at all. But it's a serious point because um, history painting, as we know, was not for most people a way of making a living in the late 18th century. With the exception was Benjamin West, because the king was afraid to pay lots of money for them. But otherwise, portraiture was the main bread and butter, and, and it was. There are very few portrait painters who don't say it is drudgery. Yeah. You know, Gainsborough says it. Reynolds probably would say it if he wasn't so diplomatic. Uh, Wright of Derby, who's a very good kind of interesting comparison with, with Rumby. And I mean, Reynolds himself, he did. He painted them in his, down, in his free time because the people with their down faces in and out, in and out. So it, it is a way of liberating your imagination. So it's, it's and that kind of mechanism. Yeah. And the, this is not, you know, looking at those, the pencil drawings are very uh, unusual. This is, these are not disegno. You know, it's this thick kind of overworked and they're not always, and they're not pretty, are they? I mean, they can be, you know, I remember seeing a load of them in, there's that exhibition in Paris years ago called Doutre-Manche, where they remember they had that. In, in, uh, it was supposed to show off British art to the French. Right. And I, all I saw in there was a huge room of Romney drawings. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, nothing wrong in a sense, but it wasn't, it's not typical. Yeah. And these aren't typical. But no. I think, yeah. Sorry. Great point. Uh, can I, uh, uh, can I uh, ask a question, Nick, which is a, uh, might seem a rather strange one, but I wonder if we've been talking about the way in which he does all this work and then fails to produce a kind of a final coherent painting. And I wonder if you find, having looked at all, I get this feeling from what your own work with this imagery that you find it quite frustrating 
that whereas we normally expect to have when we produce a piece of art, do a piece of art historical research, do our research, then come up with our paper and come up with our argument. We have a very clear sense of an argument that emerges. But I get a feeling here that you're still kind of grappling with this material and still finding it quite hard to come up with a coherent reading. And maybe yeah. it's interesting to think about whether this kind of defeats our classic art historical project of coherent readings. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the one of the best sources on these is a, is a really interesting dissertation um, from uh, 1983 by Victor Chung. And he, I think, uh, was also similarly plagued by a kind of difficulty of dealing with the works and, and, and made these really fascinating diagrams, actually, of the works in order to kind of contain them and he said here are the seven typologies of these drawings and here's how these work in this set of drawings and here's how these work in those and I think even that impulse to kind of diagram is, a, is also a kind of response to the kind of problem of what to make of, of these drawings because I absolutely um, I think your um, your suggestion is absolutely correct is that I sort of hoped I would sort of figure out what he was trying to do um, and I don't think that I have. Um, and instead, I got more interested in trying to figure out why he kept doing it, right? More the kind of the process and less the kind of um, intention or the kind of aim that might have, in the end, served a, a sort of purpose outside of it. So yeah, it's like, what, what do you do with when you're sort of confronted with this kind of mass of often also quite repetitive images, right? Many of them are quite similar to one another. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of repetition of self is a kind of exciting, but kind of frustrating um, object of study. Yeah, I'll have to make a, a, a chart with numbers. Just to say, if I found his death shortly afterwards, Howard was a national figure. And in 1795 or whereabouts, his monument appears in, in St. Paul's Cathedral, yeah. Reynolds, Johnson, William Jones. And I was looking at being, you know, in anticipation of your talk today, uh, particularly at the hat statue of Howard, stepping himself out of chains. It's a remarkable yeah, image. A very interesting. And I call freed, heroic figures stepping out of chains. You know, um, I think Reynolds is the only one with his clothes on. Uh, but that was completed later on. I was got rid of it. Whole story. Um, I thought I had it. But, uh, you know, and it's, it's interesting to set that against Romney's private obsessional kind of quest. And they are remarkable. I mean, there's, there's nothing quite like them. That's the thing. And that's why they are worthy of our time and your time, even if you can't diagrammatize them or put them all in order on the floor and <laughs> figure it all out. Because, I mean, the thing again, he is an extraordinary artist. Um, you know, with a very fertile imagination. And that, 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 you know, and it's sort of, I know I went on at the beginning about, you know, living in the blooming house in Hampstead, et cetera. But in a sense, there was this extraordinary mind tackling extraordinary problems. And, um, I, and, and sometimes yeah. that's what it's about. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's getting to the witching hour, I'm going to say, half seven. Any more, one last uh, thought any, before we um, sort of get more um, informal? No? So I think as it's 7.30, uh, we can thank Nick once more for a fascinating <laughs> talk. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. So if you'd like to stay for a chat and a drink, you're most welcome. But let me, before I release you, just say next Thursday evening's lecture, following on from Nightmares and Incarceration, uh, addresses the topic of shark attack, uh, when Nika Elder will be talking about John Singleton Copley's Watson and the Shark and Taste for Flesh, Taste for Flesh, next Thursday at 6 p.m. Join us. Thank you so much for everyone, both here in the room and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. That was Thank great. Thank you.